Hey everybody, I hope y'all are doing well today and having a good week so far. This is Thursday, and today I actually want to begin a study of the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and my plan is to do about two chapters each video, so two chapters a day, and study through the book of Matthew, and I hope that you'll join me in this, um, whether you just watch the videos and listen, or whether you um, have your Bible, follow along with me, and we'll look at it together. We'll study it together and take notes together as we go through, and I hope this will be encouraging for everybody. And I want to look at the, the whole Gospel of Matthew from beginning to end, to look at the, uh, the whole message, uh, the aim, um, the chain of events that Matthew uh, writ, wrote out for us and to look how look at how Matthew reveals the gospel of course being inspired by the Holy Spirit but we're going to start that today and I'm going to try to keep these videos somewhat um, brief um, I'm not going to try to take up too much time um, in these videos um, but I hope that it'll be um, enjoyable for you and if you ever have any questions um, on any of the videos that I do, and especially these as we go through and study God's Word together, um, you can write in the comments. I know this video is not live, um, but if you want to leave a note or ask questions in the comments um, for this video, we can definitely do some talking in that. I'll be glad to answer any questions. I uh, would appreciate any feedback and look forward to spending this time with you in God's Word. So let's get right to it. The Gospel of Matthew. I like one commentary that said, uh, the Gospel of Matthew is written by a Jew to the Jews about a Jew. And of course, the Jew that wrote this is Matthew, uh, also known as Levi, and he is writing, as we can tell from examining his uh, manner, um, examining what he wrote in his gospel, uh, that his main audience was really the Jews and their understanding of not just any particular, or not just any Jew, rather, but one very special Jew, and that is the Christ, the Messiah. And so as we read through, as we study Matthew's gospel together, let's remember the audience that is intended for this. Remember that it is to show the Jews, um, as Matthew is going to explain and point out in many different ways. And one of the biggest ways in his gospel is through prophecy. That's one of the things I love about Matthew's gospel, is Matthew really focuses on and unfolds for us all of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, all of the things that were said many, many, many years before about the Messiah, about the Christ, the chosen one of God, the king of the Jews, the one who would be king, uh, the one who would lead the people, the one who would bring salvation for the people. And he shows that all those prophecies were made or fulfilled by Jesus. And so let's, we're going to pay uh, special attention to the prophecies being fulfilled. And as we go through this, um, I'm even going to try to number them as we go along and to show how many, just how many prophecies, at least specifically mentioned by Matthew, that Jesus fulfilled in his coming and his life and all that he did. And so tonight I want to look at the first two chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, which have to do with the coming of Jesus, his birth. Um, and so we're going to look at uh, the first two chapters of Matthew and what is said about Jesus' coming into this world. So let's begin. Matthew chapter 1, you'll find at the beginning in verse 1, the book of Matthew actually opens up with the gene genealogy of Jesus. Um, as Luke also gives a genealogy at one point in time. Um, but Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus, and for good reason. Because if you remember that the Jews were very big on genealogy, it was very important um, and much to do with the law um, and those who could be priests and those who could not. Um, also the lineage and knowing their lineage and where they come from. Um, also, it was very important to know um, by prophecy of where the Christ was going to come from. And so it is only uh, understandable why Matthew... 
uh, starts with the genealogy of Jesus. And I'm not going to take the time to read all of these names and go through the genealogy. If you want to look back through that, uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I do want to point out verse 1. Matthew says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. The son of David. The son of Abraham. And that really sums up the, the reason he gives or the importance of what he wants his um, hearers and readers to see by this genealogy is to understand that Jesus the Christ comes from the lineage of Abraham as was promised by God as well as of David. Um, the, the, to show the kingship. So you have the promise, the seed promise that was made to Abraham, also the promise to David of the one, the anointed one, who would reign on his throne forever. And so that fits Jesus and his genealogy, which is what Matthew is wanting to show. And so he shows from the time, or at least the ones, um, those he chose through without the genealogy. It's, this is not an exhaustive uh, genealogy of Jesus, but he makes the connections from Abraham to David, from David to the deportation to Babylon, from Babylon to the Christ, uh, to the coming of the Christ. And so he gives that ultimately to show, as we find in verse 16, if you look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, when he finally gets to Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So Matthew begins his gospel referring to Jesus as the Christ. He is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He then shows the connection, the lineage from Abraham to David and David to Jesus, ultimately. And then shows how Joseph, who would they would know as Joseph the carpenter, Joseph of Nazareth, who was married um, eventually to Mary, uh, the Joseph and Mary being the parents of Jesus, Mary being the mother of Jesus, of whom Jesus was born. And again, Matthew pins and says that this Jesus is called the Christ. He is the Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one. And then in verse 17, or in verse 17, rather, he says, So all the generations for Abraham... From Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. And so he shows again how we get from Abraham to the Christ and how that lineage fits Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth. And that is the ultimate goal of, of Matthew's gospel is to show and to prove to give evidence that this Jesus of Nazareth is indeed, without doubt, the Christ, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And that's what we're going to see throughout his gospel. And so then we come to the birth, Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. Uh, Matthew gets right to it, um, whereas Luke really provides uh, quite a bit more detail as to the events that took place before the birth of Jesus. Matthew really gets right to it to show uh, what took place at the birth of Jesus, or at least in who was involved in that. And of course, the miraculous birth of Jesus, which he explains. Let's begin in Matthew chapter 1 now and in verse 18. He says, Now the birth of Jesus of Jesus Christ. Notice Matthew again. He's constantly referring to Jesus as Christ over and over and over. Why? Because that's his point. He wants the people to know that indeed Jesus is the Christ. So the birth of Jesus, the Christ, took place in this way, he goes on to say. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, that is, legally pledged, that basically... Uh, Mary and Joseph were not technically married yet, um, but they had a, a basically a binding legal contract uh, that they were going to get married. Um, and so it was very important and very serious. Um, it wasn't something they could just, you know, break very easily or without consequence. 
Um, and so we need to understand their situation here. They're being betrothed, being legally pledged to be married to Joseph. Mary was to Joseph. But before they came together, before they were ever finally married, I think one commentary I read was usually between the time they were betrothed, when this contract was made, and when they actually became married was about a year. So sometime within that, before they were ever married, before they came together sexually by being married, Mary was found to be with child. And Matthew could have stopped there, but of course he doesn't. Because he makes sure we understand. Because we, like, I mean, Joseph, we're going to find out, he's, he's shocked, he's hurt. He thinks she's been unfaithful, but the thing that Matthew explains in his gospel is that Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, that this was a miraculous conception by the power and doing of God, that God was using Mary to become the virgin mother, as was prophesied, we're going to see, to be the virgin mother of Jesus. But put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Joseph doesn't understand this at that time. He's not been told. And so all he sees is that his soon-to-be wife has now become pregnant. And he knows it wasn't from him. So she's been unfaithful even to him. And so he, finding out about this, her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly which shows a lot of character on Joseph. I think there's a couple ways to look at it. Maybe in some ways Joseph was trying to keep himself from being shamed, but I think more so, I think it's more the case he was wanting to keep Mary from being burdened with public shame. And so Joseph was wanting to take care of it quietly without making a big to-do in the courts and a big spectacle of it. And Joseph could have got, um, if you will, rich off of this divorce because Mary would have had to have given him the, um, her betrothal money. But he didn't want the money. He didn't want to put her to shame. He wanted to do it quietly. But... Verse 20, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins and Joseph now knows the truth. Joseph now has been told. He, an angel has come to Joseph in a dream, has, has spake to him, has spoken to him, and said, Joseph, you know, you don't need to divorce Mary because she's not been unfaithful, but this is actually the miraculous doing of God. That it is the Holy Spirit who has enabled Mary to miraculously conceive a child. But more than that, Joseph, your child is going to be a son, and your son, you are going to name him Jesus. Now, what's special about this, besides the miraculous conception, is that he is going to save his people from their sins. Imagine being Joseph and hearing this for the first time, and you know, that your wife has not been unfaithful, your soon-to-be wife has not been unfaithful, and she's miraculously conceived. But not only that, but you're given um, the gender, you're given the name, and you're told that this child of yours is going to be the one to save his people from their sins. That's a lot to take on, to take in at once. Imagine what must have been going through Joseph's mind and what he must have been thinking and feeling. Some relief... Two, that he could have faith and trust in his wife, soon to be wife, but also that God was working a miracle in his life that he would be a part of in the sense of getting to be the dad, um, the father, not, by, not biologically, but he would still get to raise this child the Son of God. And then we are told, notice in verse 22, 
that all this took place to what? To fulfill what was what the Lord had spoken and prophesied by the prophet, saying this. Here's the prophecy. Here's the prophecy that is found actually in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. When the prophecy that says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That is the prophecy. The prophecy is that there would be a woman who would be a virgin, but yet she would conceive a child, conceive a son. She would bear a son, and his name would be Emmanuel. And Jesus, or through Mary, God is now fulfilling this prophecy in that Mary is a virgin. God has just given her conception. She's going to bear a son, And he is going to be Emmanuel, which is, Matthew tells us, it means God with us. God with us. God has now given his anointed one, or sent his anointed one into the world, and God is with us. And then we are told in verse 24, so that, verse 23 So this prophecy, this is the first prophecy that Matthew brings up. So write that somewhere if you want to, jot it down. This is prophecy number one that Jesus is fulfilling. He ain't even born yet. But by his being conceived in the womb of Mary, a virgin, and then he will be born, he is fulfilling that prophecy made so long ago by the prophet Isaiah. And that's important because it is going to ultimately show Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. And finally, in verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife, but he did not know her. He did not have intercourse with her until she had after she had given birth to a son, that son that was miraculously conceived by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph did exactly what he was told to do by the angel. Joseph was told to take Mary, don't be afraid, take Mary as your wife. He did. And Joseph for nine months, or for however long, you know, they were married, did not have intercourse with her so that nothing could be pointed to him to say, oh, well, it must, you know, be his child. No. He intentionally, purposefully did not know her that way until after the birth of Jesus. And we know they would go on, Mary and Joseph to, together would have son, other sons, and daughters together, but this one, their firstborn, was a miraculous conception by God. And so, really, Joseph, you know, his part, he just got to sit and watch the power of God work. And in the birth of Jesus. And finally, Jesus is born, Matthew says, and he is given the name Jesus, which is also what Joseph was told to do. And so the faith of Joseph in here is seen. And we need to follow his example of faith. He was given a message by God. He followed and carried it out by faith and did what he was supposed to do. Well, that's chapter 1. And I know I said we were going to do two two chapters, but I'm going to go ahead and stop there for today. And so tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to come back and begin in chapter 2 and possibly see if we can do chapters 2 and chapters 3 Uh, of Matthew. And so I hope you'll tune in again tomorrow as we continue our study of the gospel of Matthew pointing to Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, our Savior. Thank you for your time and I look forward to spending more with you in God's word. God bless.